If you have your Bibles open, we're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 15 today. It begins with the words, but mark this. So if you're one of those people who likes to underline verses in your Bible, Paul is saying, get your highlighter pen out. This is important. So what are we to mark up? Well, it's not a message you want to hear in the middle of a COVID pandemic lockdown. It simply says, there will be terrible times in the last days. Now, this is a sentence we need to unpack before we can understand the things that Paul is wanting to convey to Timothy. What are these terrible times Paul is talking about? Now, the New Testament was written in Greek, and that's why you sometimes hear preachers pompously say, in the original Greek, and then explain the meaning of a word or phrase. That rarely means they understand New Testament Greek, it just means they've got a good concordance or reference source. In my case, a Bible on my computer that allows you to view the original meanings. And this is what I've discovered. The Greek word for terrible used here is only used one other time in the New Testament. And that is when the word terrible is used in Matthew's Gospel to describe two demon-possessed men who were so violent and disturbed that people kept away from them. Jesus had to dismiss the evil spiritual forces at work behind the scenes to bring peace into their lives. So what can we learn from this? Lurking behind the terrible times in the last days are what the Bible calls evil principalities and powers at work. The word times here refers to seasons or eras. So we're warned of terrible times that may last for long periods. There's going to be no quick fixes. They're long, drawn-out testing of your faith and endurance in a times of suffering and great distress. And Paul knows exactly what this feels like as he writes from prison in Rome. He's awaiting trial before Caesar and certain execution. He's locked up, alone. His fellow Christians are not visiting him. Some are undermining him. But Paul here is not talking about his own suffering. He's advising Timothy how to help Christians live in terrible times. Now this phrase, the last days, for many, conjures up those cartoon images of people walking around with placards announcing the end is nigh. But to a serious Bible teacher, it takes you into the realms of what is known as eschatology, a Greek word used for the study of the last days. And because this is a complex area of Bible study that historically has caused much controversy, conjecture, division and dispute, most people today avoid it. And sadly, that means most Christians have little understanding of future events mentioned in the Bible. And what they do know can be misleading. But we do need to understand what Paul means by the last days to also understand the context of these words. Now here's the issue. When you read of phrases in the Bible such as last days or latter days or end of time, end of the age, they're not necessarily talking about the same things. Paul is writing to people who believe they are in the last days. He's writing to point out to them that rumours that Christ has already returned are fake news. When you come across the phrase, the last days in your Bible, you need to work out who the message was intended for. Is it, for example, being addressed to the nation of Israel or Christians in the church? And in the New Testament, the last days often refers to a period of time that starts with the birth of Christ and will end when Christ returns. For example, in Hebrews 1 verse 2, we read, 
In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. And when Peter speaks at Pentecost, he uses Joel's prophecy to describe what is happening and says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. So we can understand there is a sense in which the last days start with the arrival of God's Son, Jesus, on earth. But the Bible clearly says no one knows when this time finishes. No one knows the day or hour Jesus will return for his bride, the church. We are encouraged to live in the expectation that Christ could return today. So we won't be ashamed at his return. So in this sense, we are already in the last days. There have been many terrible times since Jesus came to earth, and there will be many more until he returns again. But that is not what the prophets in the Old Testament are referring to as the last days, or many of the scenes depicted in the book of Revelations. Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Hosea, Micah, and so on, all talk about the last days. Now, from the earliest of times, God has warned us through prophets of a specific time of distress. The Hebrew word distress means tribulation. This great tribulation is something in the future, and we're told it will last for seven years. And that tribulation is ended with the return of Christ to reign on earth from Jerusalem and set up his kingdom. Christ will reign on earth for 1,000 years, and therefore it's referred to as the millennium. So the last days referred to by the Old Testament prophets, prophets is often focused around the future events of the great tribulation and the millennium reign of Christ. Now, you may have heard football pundits talk about a game of two halves. Well, the seven-year tribulation is a bit like that. In the first half, a great deceiver known as the Antichrist will be welcomed worldwide as a powerful saviour who brings peace to the Middle East. But in the second half, there is death and destruction on a scale that this world has never seen before. Only the intervention of Christ to bind Satan and his evil work prevents total annihilation. So as Christians, we are both in the last days, in which there will be terrible times, and we also live in a world that's heading towards the Great Tribulation. Now that raises a question, will the church go through that tribulation? Many conclude that Jesus will return for his church before this tribulation. Indeed, the removal of Christians might even provide the vacuum for the great lawlessness that follows. Some think Christ will return during the half-time interval, during the tribulation, and some think at the end. My job today is not to outline these arguments, but to encourage you to be prepared and ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ at any time. To help us understand this, Jesus used the analogy of pregnancy and childbirth. Jesus talks about the birth pains at the end times. There are tough times in pregnancy and some women have weeks of sickness and suffering. And then the contractions start and these painful contractions increase in both their intensity and then frequency to become unbearable. Before the birth of our first child, Jill and I attended classes for future parents in which I noticed that all the women were determined to have a natural childbirth without painkillers. However, later, when they shared their experience, it became evident that most had screened for an epidural at the earliest opportunity. Same might be said of us. In tough times that challenge our faith, are we going to endure or give up? Just like Peter, we think we could never deny Christ, but actions are always harder than words.
So Paul is writing to Timothy at a time when the early church is in a terrible situation. There is a great persecution of Christians prompted by the Emperor Nero. And there is another painful time we know that took place after this persecution. In 70 AD, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, just as Jesus had predicted. The Jews are dispersed around the world. It is a terrible time of tribulation, but it is not the great tribulation. And through every age, Christians have lived in distressing time and faced all kinds of suffering. Paul is writing to Timothy to encourage him not to give up in troubled times. He says in verse 12, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And here's the final point I would like to make. The last times are times of deception. And as the world heads towards the tribulation, just like birth pains, this deception will increase. We live in an age which is controlled by the spirit of Antichrist but we are heading towards a time when the Antichrist himself will appear in person. Jesus warned his disciples not to be deceived in the last days. He said, false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. And Jesus warns many Christians will fall away as a result. Because of lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. And Paul lists the characteristics of those within the church who are leading people astray at that time. It's a long list, so I'll quickly read through it. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure. Sounds just like a typical teenager to me. Now many think these are characteristics of society in the last days. And I've heard many preachers point out uh, how people uh, at the time they're preaching fit into those descriptions. But has there ever been a time when society did not exhibit these things? Now, the context here is Paul is warning about these things becoming the characteristics of people within the church. And he goes on to mention the sexual scandals in the church at that time caused by men with deprived minds and the gullible women they have enticed. And Paul warns that miraculous signs and wonders are sometimes counterfeit. He mentions Yanis and Yambres, the Egyptian false prophets who replicated two of the miraculous signs that Moses performed before Pharaoh. And he describes them as men who oppose the truth. In the last days, the Bible warns there will be an increase of miracles that are outside of God's truth and not done in God's power. Now, it's easy to apply this list to others, but as it's directed to the church, we must make a personal application and ask, to what extent... Am I a lover of myself, a lover of money, boastful, proud, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, a lover of pleasure, and so on? And a key question, to what extent do I have a form of godliness but deny its power? If I tick these boxes, then Paul warns other Christians to stay away from me as I will lead them astray. 
in the last days, the apostate church is going to be full of people like this. To conclude, notice how that list is in contrast to how Paul lived. Timothy knew firsthand how Paul had suffered for his faith and stayed strong. He came from the same region where Paul had been stoned and left for dead. Timothy knew all about Paul's teaching, his way of life, his purpose, his faith, his patience, his love, his endurance, his persecution, his sufferings. And these were to serve him as an example of how to live for God in troubled times. We are living in terrible times today, in the midst of a COVID pandemic, and we really don't know what the future holds. But we know who holds the future. Don't be deceived, don't fall away, see that no one leads you astray. As Paul says to Timothy, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced. And remember that the Christian term, the last day, just signals a new beginning and a future with Christ that is too wonderful for words. God bless you all. Amen.